know, what most people find, and of course our customers generally are planners. They want to make sure they're making great decisions. Uh, they know their numbers. They know their finances. They have a lot of experience. The only thing that's really going to vary in that range is the property taxes, because there's homes here that are 1,400 square feet. There's homes here that are upwards of 3,500 square feet. So uh, that's, that's the, uh, the range. Uh, again, including co-op fees, taxes, utilities, total cost of living, and of course there's a lot of things you, you just don't pay for that you pay for uh, elsewhere. Um, but most importantly, <coughs> in this day and age is, aside from how much it costs, is how stable is it? And what are the reserves? When you have collective maintenance that your co-op, that you're a shareholder of, is responsible for, repainting of homes, uh, re-roofing of homes, replacement of walkways, the money needs to be there and there needs to be a plan. And I, it's safe to say this community is very well planned. John Coughlin is our Director of Operations. And Jane's going to introduce John or ask John a few questions. Yeah. So John, uh, John is Director of Operations, and it was under John's guidance and leadership that the reserves really came into its strength. And I want John to tell everybody a little bit about your background, mm -hmm. because John is not only from Maine, he has also worked nationally within this industry. And I'd like John to tell you his story and then uh, a little bit about the reserve. So John, sure. can you share it with everybody please? Sure. Ten years ago, folks, uh, I was working as a property manager along the eastern coast of North Carolina. Uh, I was managing a portfolio of gated golf communities, uh, the largest of which was 1,500 homes, uh, and I was the property manager for those folks. Uh, my daughter had our first grandchild five years ago here locally, and it was time for my wife and I to come home and this worked out wonderfully because it, it appears that this job is very similar to what I did down south. But it appears that I was the piece of the puzzle that was necessary and they were looking for to come in and take some of my experiences and leadership ability with the team that we had to charge forward. And I believe we've done that. We've made great strides. But as Jane just said, one of the things that was really missing here because of the evolution of the community still being young, many residents were concerned about, are we putting enough money away for those capital improvements? You know, I'm not talking about your utilities or, or replacing your washer and dryer. I'm talking about all those big ticket items, your roof, the painting of your house, uh, the street lights, this community center, uh, replacing the pump and the pool, etc. Because I learned one thing from my boss down south that if a community had to have special assessments out of the ordinary dues, then the manager was not doing their job. And I came in here with open eyes. For the first month of my tenure here, I measured, looked, wrote down, studied every bit of information of the homes that were here, the infrastructure, began to review some of the trends of the community, and actually did a professional reserve study, which I, was, which I did down south, for not only the common area here, that which is common to everybody, plus the individual residential neighborhood that you live in. And we actually have, and we boast, and you're going to hear John Atkinson, a resident within this community, continue to talk about this plan, but we have a professional reserve study that we update yearly, plugging in any type of new information, the balances of your funds, etc., any changes that you wanted to make. And I would just explain to you here briefly, because sometimes when I do this in my office for special residents, some people nod off. And I know how numbers work, especially after you've had lunch. Okay? <laughs> so we won't go there. But over on this Right here is some information that I will refer to, as long as my card. And if I don't answer, or if I tickle your fancy on it, please email me with any questions. This is a, an abridged common reserve schedule. 
Currently, the 161 units that we have here are paying $15 a month. That's going to everything that you see that's not in your neighborhood. This community center, the common roads that are in here, the street lights, etc., etc. You will see the plan in here that takes it out 30 years that shows your funding to be exceptional. You will see the expenses outlined in here that are inflation adjusted. Boy, is that a key ingredient. Because all across America, five out of six homes that are being built new today are in an association. That being a condo, a co-op, or an HOA. Many developers, and most developers, may not give a true eye to reserving the funds in your fees so that you've got enough when you need it. It's the role of the residents to demand such a study and a property manager to come in and do it for you. This common reserve study will show you what is being done for your common areas. Additionally, there's one for the particular neighborhood that you live in. All the neighborhoods are similar. They're all paying currently $75 a month. There is a schedule in here that is going to get you through the key moments of the roof replacements. We currently have a seven-year paint cycle. The, uh, basically, the streets within your co-op when they are going to be sealed, a one-inch overlay, etc., etc., etc. This is your money in the bank. This guarantees that your homes and your amenities are taken care of the way that you want them. No surprises. This sets us apart. This is part of the strength and stability that you'll hear all of our people talking about. People who are in the know, researching throughout the country, are coming to us and saying, you've got what we're asking for. What is the plan to take care of our community? How are we going to do it? Because that causes your value to appreciate. Additionally, we have a very strong budgeting process. And over on this, this table, we'll show you last year's budget and the current year budget. The Finance Committee, and we're very excited about this, because we use the current year's actuals, look at the trends, and we already have the 2015 proposal in the hands of our finance committee, made up of residents, to review. And we're very excited to announce that it appears that we are going to have a very minimal increase of just four or five dollars a month. That's what we try to achieve, less than three percent so that you will see this, and I've also included a short packet that is our most recent financial packet. Uh, April 30th of the current year, you will see a variance narrative showing you why we're ahead, uh, pros and cons. You will see a community balance sheet showing you over $50 million in assets. You will see an income statement for the community uh, as, as well in this as well. So you numbers people, you'll see it all right there. Will. I'd like to ask Jane a quick question and then have you skip it back to John to talk about uh, inflation, et cetera. Oh, yeah. But uh, my question to you all of a sudden is, uh, looking at communities all over the country, how many communities, uh, A, have looked into their reserves in such a fashion and um, B, who share such a, I'm actually looking at this thinking, wow, talk about transparency, but mm -hmm. uh, how many communities share this depth of numbers with uh, their? Very few do. On the national level, the companies that you recognize, like Del Webb and Pulte and Shea and communities like that, will have a very tight reserve study. However, they don't share it with you until you become a resident. That is not given to anybody until you become a resident. Uh, in terms of paralleling this, very few communities do this. And consequently, uh, some of the condominium communities, the HOA communities over the last 20 years have gotten kind of a bad reputation because of that assessment that Claire talked about earlier 
for her condo that she didn't own very long in Portland, but there was a very large assessment that was uh, <coughs> her way as well as the way of the other residents there. What John is explaining here is the protection on that. What Will is asking, how does this parallel? This is not your general operations of communities. It isn't. It, it, it goes a cut above. I can, I can tell you that from experience from all the communities that I have worked with. This is a cut above. And John, what about inflation? How does that factor? Well, in? you know, this, this is the second step of reserve planning, and this will lead into our next person on the panel, in that if you're not investing your monies to outpace inflation, obviously the expenses down the road won't be enough to make those purchases and such that leads to assessments as well. We're very fortunate here to have very talented people uh, and without stealing the thunder, we are investing your funds that are not needed for 24 months as per the plan in a conservative model that will outpace inflation. If we're going to replace that pool out there in the year 2025, your dollars, your $15 a month that are encumbered to replace that portion of your common really shouldn't be at the local bank, excuse me, Linda, at 0.01% or whatever it is. 0.1. 0.1, okay. Uh, if we can do a little bit better in securities, etc., cetera, guard it, uh, that's the way to go. Thank you, John. You're welcome. That's a good segue into John Atkinson, and John is a resident here, and John, I'd like you to tell us just a little bit about your story and uh, your interaction as a resident here on the committee that you're on. Sure. I, I uh, moved here in 2006. We built, built a house over on uh, Chickadee Drive while we were moved up from Maryland. I continued to work until 2009, kind of uh, commuting sometimes, working from home a lot. And I worked for Morgan Stanley for 31 years. So right through the crisis and after the crisis in uh, 2009, at the end, I re finally retired. And uh, that was around the time that John joined us, I think. Uh, and things started to change here pretty dramatically. And John went over his uh, work with uh, setting up a reserve model uh, and a study. And that seemed to be very timely to start to actually look at how the reserves were maintained, custodialized, and invested. So we collaborated on a uh, program that kept in mind the idea of safety first. Nobody wants an assessment. We don't want to be facing the community saying we lost money in biotechnology stocks or something crazy like that. <laughs> So the idea was born to uh, keep two years, as John alluded to, two years of capital expenditures would be kept in a bank, safe, has nothing to do with the Reserve Investment Committee, which is what we have now, uh, and only the assets, the, the funds that would be uh, kept for expenditures beyond two years uh, would be put into an investment account. And uh, that is updated every six months, so it's kind of a rolling two years, two years, six months later, it's another two years, etc. cetera. Uh, and we've started to build those reserves. And of course, that varies from phase to phase, simply because the, the roofing schedule varies from phase to phase, the painting, some houses are older than others, so there's a rhythm to the, uh, to the expenditures. Each one has an independent uh, rhythm to it. The way it is set up is that each uh, co-op has a member on the Reserve Investment Committee. I'm the chairman of the committee, and all of the other phases have, uh, have representatives that are voted by the board of directors uh, each and every year as to whether to maintain that individual, change the individual, etc. cetera. Uh, the, I, the goal, and I'll just read it to you, this is an investment policy statement that I, I produced the first draft of which is three three pages long. Uh, thankfully, we have an attorney whose name is Ken Thorson, retired attorney, who took a good look at it. Uh, we had an, have an insurance person took a good look at it in terms of directors and uh, officers insurance, etc. So we got it. it it's very tight. Uh, the thing is, is that uh, it, it really is fairly uh, groundbreaking. There are no, I believe, you can correct me now, we couldn't find any condominium or co-op uh, in the, in the co-ops in the country that were actually adopting a model like this. So what I did was I took a nonprofit model and then adapted it to our needs. 
uh, nonprofit in terms of the asset allocation. The goal of the of the the uh, pool, which is called the Reserve Investment Fund, the investment objective of the RIF Reserve Investment Fund is to obtain a total return of two percent or more above U.S. CPI plus U, which is the overall, including food and energy, plus the cost of managing the fund over a full market cycle, three to five years. And that, again, is money, monies that are not scheduled to be spent within the first two years. Uh, it's beyond that. And there are certain a, a lot of uh, detail to this in terms of how much maximum can be in equities, how much maximum in fixed income, uh, money market funds, uh, you know, ratings, uh, Standard Poor's 500, Russell 1000. Uh, you know, you're welcome to read it. I think John will easily provide that. Uh, so there's a lot of lot of work that was done on that, including I'll read you one other passage that I, that we uh, decided on that was quite important. At least one member of the Reserve Investment Committee shall be or have been an investment professional with experience in managing the investments of individual or pooled investment accounts. If there is no such person residing in the Highland Green community with this background that is willing to serve on the Reserve Investment Committee, a decision will be required by each cooperative board to continue to lot, rely on the investment committee to seek an external investment advisory service or adopt another strategy. So far that's not a problem because I'm, I'm the one. We do have somebody else that is but who's not on the committee right now because he's in my, happens to be in my phase so we don't have two from the same phase. Uh, but at any rate, uh, that's, that's kind of the setup of it. And my experience uh, to bear on this is that I manage portfolios for uh, pension funds. I, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Chilean pension system, which is uh, a giant uh, defined contribution system, be as if the United States took Social Security and turned it into individual accounts for everybody, like 401ks. Uh, so I was involved in managing a portion of that outside the, uh, uh, their investments outside of Chile, non-domestic investments, as well as the same for Peru. And I had uh, quite a few clients in South, South America and Southeast Asia of uh, central banks where my customers investing their reserves in U.S. Treasuries. So as well as some individuals uh, on top of that, uh, high net worth individuals. So that's kind of the background that I brought to this. And uh, so far, so good. It's running very well. We're, we have a very conservative operating. We're not trying to beat the S&P. We do measure ourselves against the S&P, the equity holdings. Uh, but we're not trying to beat the S&P. We're trying to beat CPI. That's, that's, our, that's our idea because the bank right now, uh, any bank investments or money market fund investments or U.S. Treasury investments uh, out to quite a few years right now, 10 years, 10-year 10 treasuries are at 2.6 percent, which is a ballpark where inflation is. It's probably a little bit higher, right around there. And uh, so anything invested in short-term securities is like being on a treadmill that's, uh, you're not walking as fast as the treadmill is running against you. You know, you're losing money, essentially, in real terms. So the goal here is to uh, invest the funds so that we maintain inflation plus two and, and that will help to keep the uh, the annual increases down. John models in the results uh, into his formula to determine what the fees are on an annual basis. We wrote this in 2011. First floods came in in uh, January 2012 so we're two years and almost six months now rolling along. Uh, funds are in and out only one time a year. It's a very easy calculation. We hold semi-annual presentations for the collective boards of directors with all residents invited to those. The next one will be July 22nd here. So January and July we do that and update on what we've been doing for the six months in, in between and the results going all the way back to day one and take any questions that uh, that anyone might have. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. John, share with us what the residents attitude has been toward the work that you and your committee are doing and the work that John's leadership is is forging within the community. Tell me what people are giving you as feedback as residents. Well, that's that's a nice question. The feedback, of course, has been very positive, and when I get the feedback, I always say, don't confuse brains with a bull market. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll we'll see how that stands up as uh, when the markets roll over at some point. But uh, but we've been very careful to, for example, uh, you know, we have a mandate of twenty percent to sixty percent in uh, fixed income. 
um, I believe it is, yes, 20 to 80 percent in fixed income, bonds of some sort. And it, with interest rates so low and our expectation that the, uh, there's, it's very um, unlikely that they're going to continue to be so low over an extended period of time that we've, we've hugged that 20 percent number and uh, fixed income is defined as uh, an, a maturity of over one year. And so we're buying CDs that are one year and one month, or one year and six months. I mean, we're staying very close to the close to the wind on that uh, that portion of the investments. And yet, in the uh, on the equity portion, it, it runs the gamut. Uh, you know, just tossing out some names that you might recognize: United Technologies, Cummins Engine, uh, Microsoft, Kellogg, J.P. Morgan, um, CenturyLink, which is a phone company. I know I'm missing I'm missing a few here. Microsoft. Um, we have a couple of orders in right now, and we are at. Uh, we just got an inflow in January, February actually, because that's the annual time we receive inflows or outflows, and they were all inflows this year. So, uh, so therefore, our uh, total equity percentage, which was up to around 35 percent because of the inflows, got knocked down into the 22 to 24 percent range, which is where we are now in equities. Uh, so we're, we're very careful and very cautious, but we're beating our benchmark. I mean, we're beating it quite handily at the moment, uh, and we uh, hope to continue to do that. All right. Thank you, John. Can I give some feedback? Uh, you were asking about feedback. Well, one, the work that John Coughlin has done in this community is very noticeable, having overlapped his tenure here. Uh, I also know that John Coughlin's granddaughter is graduating <laughs> Uh, in about five minutes. Uh, so if he wants to go, uh, <laughs> That's I know he was nervous about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you all came. And if you have any questions, my card's there. Look forward to seeing you again. Now, before you go, let me add to that because that's you know this is the partnership without really speaking much to uh, each other about it because we have to rely entirely on the numbers that he's generating as far as the reserve studies. And those reserve study numbers are the, the, the numbers that free up or cause a call on the investments that we're maintaining. Correct. So it's really quite a partnership. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't look at what over our shoulder as to what we're doing, and we don't really look over the shoulder at what he's doing, except the boards do, mm -hmm. of course. And I'm on the board, too, so from that aspect, we do. Um, but it really is a, a, you know, a, a nice duopoly we have running here on this, I think. <laughs> so, Fantastic. So, John, easy exit before we go on to Linda. Thank if you. you want to go, I will. I will. Have your, see All your right, thanks, guys. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to give see you, John. Have fun. Uh, some further feedback. You were asking John about feedback. Let me tell you about some of the feedback that that I get. Um, uh, obviously, everyone's got a different background and knowledge base. I, I was an English major. I don't really understand most of what John's saying, but I know it's good. <laughs> but um, uh, let me tell you, some of our customers, everybody has different backgrounds, but most recently uh, we're working with somebody who's moving here, building a home, who's the CFO of a, a major commercial construction organization in Maine. So this guy knows what he's looking at, right? And then another couple, uh, the, the gentleman is a controller for a wine distribution company in New York and also was on the board and finance committee for a huge condo development uh, in Connecticut at one point. Uh, and so the ability to, for me to sit down with John Coughlin and John Atkinson with customers who really know what they're looking at is uh, invaluable to the value uh, of Highland Green. It's amazing, actually. And, and that, I think that also contributes to the sense of confidence that the residents have. Absolutely. There, there, there has to be a sense of confidence in moving forward. This is a financial decision for everybody, whether it be people who are in the community and decide to stay in the community or people who are considering the community. It all has to make sense, and it has been made transparent, which is a huge plus in communities, I can tell you. So before we move on to Linda, I want to uh, say a little bit about John. First of all, um, he's not just a numbers guy. Uh, he, he's a guy who's uh, got two bolts, one of which the bilge pump is broken today. Uh, he was just telling you about it. So John may have to exit uh, soon before his boat sinks. But uh, there's a photo up here as well 
Uh, John is also, this is, has anyone heard of the big, big green, egg? Oh, big yeah. egg, oh, yeah. big <laughs> green eggs? They're a cooking oh. device, ceramic and oh, cast yeah. iron, I think, something like that. Ceramic, yeah. And they're very cool. And uh, this is an event that was a resident event a couple of weeks ago, which was a practice uh, for John. Uh, John is the head of a team that's now called the Highland Green Egg Masters, uh, who are competing, I think it's next week. Week from tomorrow at the New England Egg Fest in Brentwood, New Hampshire. And this is actually a photo from last year's Oh, event. that's from last year, yeah. And that was the, the winning entry, actually. We got one of the two first prizes. So, so yeah. defend, defending wow. champions, and it's you, and is there seven other yeah, Highland Green residents? That's, yeah, that are seven, yes, that'd be right. Yep, so yep. we're printing out some t-shirts to represent Highland Green, and we expect you to bring home the hardware. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now... We want to talk to Linda Bernier from Bass Savings Bank. And Linda, you not only have worked with lots of residents that have come in here, 100 or so residents through Bass Savings Bank, but you also have another personal connection with Highland Green. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and your connection to Highland Green, please. Sure. I've actually lived in Topsom since 1975. So I'm probably the oldest one in the room that's lived here. Um, we lived on the actually the other side of the Cathians River, so I have to cross that river, you know, every day going home, and had no idea. It, all it is is just this little stream at the head of tide um, that really didn't mean much, um, I think, to many people in the community. And when John Wozlewski was starting to look at developing this site, and John Rensenbrink, who's one of my neighbors, um, one of the co-founders of um, Korea with, with John, um, started talking and, you know, I started talking to him and he says, Linda, he says, you wouldn't believe the beauty of this river. I mean, like I said, all I saw was this little kind of murky stream and this little fall where there was a big mill apartment. Um, so I became involved with Korea, um, with John Runsenbrink, and was on the initial board, um, we actually were the ones who were able to construct the ecology building, develop the trails um, back in, geez, it's probably been 15 years now. I mean, it's 11. That's all? I, I'm terrible at history <laughs> time. Um, and Korea being, again, just to reinforce the Cadence River Education Alliance, which is the nonprofit organization that manages the conservation land that's here adjacent and in, within Highland Green. Right. And John Rensenbrink, your neighbor, right. well, was a professor at Bowdoin uh, and co-founded that group with our founder and developer, John Wozleski. Um, so it was, you know, that agreement between the two of them um, to conserve, conserve that land um, instead of building an 18-hole golf course, um, there really was quite a compromise. And it was called the Topsom Compromise. Um, that, you know, th there was a nice balance between having the nine-hole golf course and, and that 235-acre preserve. Um, so I became involved with, with CREA as they were developing programs for the local schools, um, as well as financing the homes here. I'd been financing um, cooperatives since the very beginning, um, did most of the financing at the Highlands across the street. Um, so when Highland Green was being developed, um, it was just natural that, that we also extended um, our lending over here. Um, and I, I believe we've been the lead bank. I've probably financed in total well over 100 between both communities. Um, and know, know the process quite well, um, and certainly the residents. So. so Linda, let's lay it out here. Let's take... Uh, take these folks on a journey from point A, they come in to see you, to point B being the end process. Can you just give us a, a, a quick snapshot of what that looks like? You know, the first question I usually ask, you know, prospective um, <coughs> residents is, you know, what are your thoughts and what are your plans? I mean, do you expect to have a mortgage? Usually when they're calling me, they're, they're in need of some financing. Do they expect to have a mortgage long term? because we can provide 30-year financing? Or do they have an event that 
you know, they anticipate happening, whether it's a sale of real estate or, you know, another event where they might need financing on a shorter term. And from there, we can actually be flexible and structure a mortgage to help bridge your needs. So if you have a home in another state or another community that is on the market, you expect to sell that and perhaps pay this loan off once that sells, we could provide bridge loan financing. Um, so you're really only making one payment while you're owning both. Um, or if you're looking at construction financing, um, right now phase three, there's what a 18 to 24 month construction period um, from now until when the home is expected to be complete. So we're flexible enough that we're able to um, provide a 24 month construction period where normally our construction loans are only 12 months. So we're, we're very flexible to meet your needs, um, if, if possible. Um, so once I have an understanding of, of your thoughts, we are able to put a, a model together um, to help you with that financing. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. I'll tell you so, that uh, everybody loves working with Linda, who's moved here. Uh, she's amazing. Um, I'm just... Sorry to go through this again, but there, I will say that on the financing end of things, some banks get it, some banks don't. Fast Savings Bank gets it, and they understand what this is because this is, it's not a fee simple. A lot of banks correct. just like to work with fee correct. simple. This is not a fee simple, as you know. So it does take an experienced banker who understands cooperative home ownership. Uh, to be able to get into that, and that's why we wanted Linda here today to help you understand that. This is Red Maple Lane. There's eight uh, home sites. They're all sold. They're all being built on right now, and six out of the eight are doing construction finance because everyone's in the same boat. They got to get from point A to point B. There's no perfect way to do it, and so Linda's been able to bridge that gap for six out of eight of those people, and uh, out of these people, I believe she's. You know, this is this is one and a half to two years out. These folks, and she's already met with four of them. Right. Uh, you know, and so a, that's the way it goes. That's right. what we're there, saying. There's another thing that I have witnessed uh, across the country, and that is that when people are thinking about making this uh, this move in their life onto the next adventure, they have always thought, "I need to sell my home first. That's my asset." doesn't matter how much money I have in my portfolio, I have always thought I'm going to sell my home first and then I'm going to parlay that money into a new home for myself. Well, what happens and what has happened in the past because of the recession, homes are staying on the market longer, we don't have that same condition now in the marketplace across the country. Homes are on the market for a shorter period of time. In fact, a lot of people think, well, I'll put my home on the market and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a year or so to sell. Not so. We're seeing homes being sold within a week, within two weeks. Somebody on the panel just said, gee, within 24 to 48 hours, once it got into our realtor's hands, our home was sold. We needed a place to go. So that is where your bank comes into play with you and be able to make those things happen for you Get out of your mindset of that I'm always going to, I've always thought I'm going to parlay this chunk once I have it into this. There's other ways of doing that to make your lifestyle happen sooner than later. You're in control of that. And a bank who can work with you with that flexibility that Linda is talking about I think is very important. So, so uh, I think that... Yeah, that kind of sums it up. Uh, I just wanted to introduce you some of the team and how it works. And so let's move on.